multi-potentiality it's about our lives right it's mm -hmm. about our creativity it's about who we are it's about our identity it's about who we want to be it's about our philosophy it's about all these different things and within the the, the box and it is a box but there's so much room within that i never get bored hi everyone and welcome to careers 2.0 today i'm speaking with jake mcneil Jake's content speaks to me directly, and I think it would to you too, if you have a lot of passions and a lot of ideas, and you're always told to stay in your lane and niche down. Instead, we're talking with Jake about niching up, not niching down, and how to combine your passions into your brand new career 2.0. Enjoy. Well, let's start maybe with your experience with people who have multiple passions uh, and you've been working for over two decades with artists mostly and you realize, right, that all of them basically are multi passionalites They have more than one passion, more than one interest. Um, I see the same. I see it all around, especially in creator economy. But I wonder, is it more common for people to be multi passionalites than actually be mono passionalites actually yeah simply because uh it's part of creativity so to be a multi potentialite or a multi passionate um uh it requires diversion thinking which means that we think in a very very wide lens so we've got multidisciplinary thinking we ha we know lots or we know uh, quite a lot about lots of different subjects and it's by adding those different subjects together which gives us our diversion thinking which gives us our creativity Whereas uh, a convergent thinker, which is a neurotypical, they uh, think very convergently. So they think five plus five equals 10. There's only one definitive answer. But our brains go, how many different numbers can we add together to make 10? And that gives us multiple different answers, which gives us our creativity. But how is that? Um, do you think that inherently most people are convergent thinkers? Or is it like educational system that molds us into this, uh, you know, basically labor market that is requires one particular skill that's what we need to focus on and only now we're sort of exploring ourselves uh wider yeah pretty much so so uh, the nasa in the 1960s the nasa's did a creativity test so they were the first one to do it and they used it as a divergent thinking test and all they simply did is they gave uh kids uh, a, a fork and they had to say how many different uses can you come up with this fork right and by the way, this is the same methodology they used to hire the scientists that got the first man on the moon. So it's a very effective, it's a very effective test. So they tried it out with uh, five-year-olds and 98% of the kids were diverted thinkers, which uh, NASA at the time deferred, uh, referred to as creative geniuses. They went back five years time uh, when the kids were 10 and only 16% of the same kids were divergent thinkers. They went back five years time again when they were 15 and only 2% of the kids were remained divergent thinkers. So for, in the main, um, we all start off as divergent thinkers, as kids. We're very curious. We're very creative. We, we, we love to create things for the joy of creating things as opposed to outcomes, results. So a few things happen. Uh, so once you hit about six or seven, our consciousness kicks in. So that's we start our fear of failure, our fear of not being good enough, comparing ourselves next to others. So that means we stop taking risks. We stop doing, taking so many chances and pushing ourselves creatively. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is that we're, we're taught to think convergently. Five plus five equals ten. That's how we're that's how we're educated. So we're educated to be convergent thinkers because the world is full of neurotypicals, which is the majority, and they, uh, you know, it's a specialized. Uh, you're you're trained to be a specialist. You pick one thing, you do it for ten thousand hours, you become an expert. Blah blah blah. The creative people aren't like that because multipotentialite is the psychological term for people who have multiple creative and or academic talents. But hey, maybe maybe it's better to be. Um... To, to, to be to think more linearly because after all you are here to help us with um managing our multiple passions so that's a that, is that a problem <laughs> or we should strive to actually be uh multi-passionalites well i mean uh, we are what we are right I'm, I'm a neurodivergent so that means i'm a divergent thinker right so what i have to do is i have to maximize my potential uh, by maximizing the, uh, the blessings of multipotentiality and minimizing the curses, right? And that's the same. For if, if you're a neurotypical, it's the same. But the best problem solvers are actually divergent thinkers because 
Um, if you look at the Einsteins, the Charles Darwins, the Marie Curies, the Florence Nightingales, all these people were all multi, uh, multi-potential like people. And they, they were skilled in multiple domains. And to solve problems, we have to, uh, uh, to you know, use our multidisciplinary thinking to join the dots, spot differences, and add things together to create new and unique solutions. But if we are sort of molded into this uh, neurotypical way of thinking, uh, can we reverse the process? Well, I mean, this, this, this is the social conditioning. Our social conditioning tells us that we have to niche down. We have to pick one thing, that we have to be consistent. We have to be productive. These are all strengths of neurotypicals, but they're all weaknesses uh, of most potentialites. So we have to find different ways to be able to do it. So instead of niching down, so niching down is taking something. So if I was to niche down, I'd only work, I'd work with multi-potentialites only in productivity. And that's all I would talk about. Just mm-hmm. write blogs about productivity, videos about productivity. And I would not last a week because I'd be bored silly. So, so what I suggest to do instead, instead of niching down, minimizing our talents into one single thing, is to add our talents up together. Talent stacking, you call that niching up. That's something that you talk a lot about. and um, I do. And, and, and uh, I wonder... What does it exactly mean? So um, I don't want to, to turn this into any sort of um, session, a therapy session for myself or a coaching session, but let, let's, use, let's use me as an example. Me even hosting this podcast is an example of my multi-passionate approach to life. I'm doing sales, I'm doing graphic design, and now I'm a host of the podcast. And money in my life comes from many different ways. And I'm being constantly told, well, maybe you should start this business. Maybe you should focus on this. Maybe you should do this specifically. How would I go about niching up all my interests, or some of them at least, into some mold? Well, it all depends on the, your, uh, what all your, your skills and talents are. Let, let me use somebody like Dr. Seuss as a good example, right? So Dr. Seuss was a copywriter. He also, he's also happens to be the best-selling uh, children's author of all time. So he, he was a copywriter, and he was a poet um, and an illustrator, but very much on an amateur basis. Now, he created, he, he stacked up his skills for storytelling, for creativity, for copywriting, for poetry and illustration. And if you stack all those things up, then he became a world-class author. So that's building your own niche, basically, like creating your own category. Correct. What are the ways that we can find that? How do you help people find that niche that is up? So as divergent thinkers, we've got multiple ideas. Every time you have an idea, it gives you another idea and it gives you another idea. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So the problem is, is that we have too many ideas. It's not that we don't have enough ideas. So if Mm -hmm. you're neurotypical, you're probably good at one or two things. So it's very easy for you to build a business. So for example, my father, he's neurotypical. He's retired now, but he was only ever good at one thing, which was with numbers. So he took that one skill and he became an accountant and that solved the problem for small businesses with their tax, VAT, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're neurotypical, it's very simple. If you are multi-potentialite, you have multiple ideas, you've got multiple talents. So which one do you focus on? Because if you focus on one, then you feel formal for all the rest, right? You think, okay, well, I'm going to focus on my podcasting skills, mm-hmm. but what about my sales skills? What are my this skills, right? Okay. So we have to find ways to be able to uh, take all those ideas and minimize them. So we have to use mental models. We have to use frameworks. So one of the frameworks I use is we look at solving specific problems. So for example, like I struggled with picking one idea. I struggled with multi-potentiality uh, for, my, for my whole career. I, I watched artists in the music industry, some of them who sold millions of albums, number ones, also struggled with the same thing. So what I'm now doing is I've created a bunch of solutions and I'm helping the younger version of myself with a problem I've already faced. And this means that, that what I do is very purposeful and, and fulfilling. It's something that I, a problem I have solved myself and I could help the younger version of myself do that. And that helps me narrow down because I could do multiple different things. Because like you, I'm a creator. Uh, I'm also a writer. I'm a blogger. I, I do videos. I do all these different things. But I focus it in one direction, which is to help multi-potentialites, you know, fulfill their creative potential. Can we um, move back in your career a little bit? And I know that you had a blog for like, I think, a year and a half or a couple of years and changed the the niche and the, the audience that it was targeted multiple times. It was about everything and, and, and nothing, right? So yeah. how did you reach your conclusion and you find found that making content or make, helping people that are basically a younger version of yourself is the way to, to go? Yeah, well, so I mean, I, I worked in the music industry for 28 years. So I was an artist manager. 
Now, it's not artist managers have to, multi potentialites have to be very good artist managers because you're doing multiple things. You're, you're overseeing. It's a very uh, big picture thinking, strategic overview where you're looking after many different things, radio, promotion, da 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 da, da marketing, et cetera, right? Uh, it was during this period that I noticed that all the artists were multi-potentialites, right? But I didn't know what multi-potentialite was at the time. I didn't know, I didn't, uh, I didn't know it was neurodivergent. I didn't know they were neurodivergent, mm -hmm. but now I realize that's what it well was, right? And what happens is that they were picking, you know, they'd come to me with a song idea and say, oh, that's a great idea for a song. Okay, two days later, I'd say, how's it going with this song? Oh, I've moved on to another song. I've moved on to another song, moved on to another song, okay? So basically, throughout the course of this, I had to come up with a bunch of strategies and frameworks to help people pick one thing, okay? So take their divergent thinking and converge it, right? And then to start and finish that project. And that carried over. So when I left the music industry, I was no longer an artist manager, obviously. After 28 years, I had no idea what I was going to do in my life. So I was stuck, right? And I kept spinning my wheels because I could do this and I could do that, I could do that. So I was stuck in what I call the divergent thinking paradox, where we have so many ideas, but we are overwhelmed with the paradox uh, of choice, which means we get stuck and then we procrastinate. And of course, our self-esteem is directly linked to our productivity. So if we're not being productive, we start we lose our confidence and we start being ourselves up and so on. And I was caught in this spiral for about nine months. So eventually I decided, right, I'm just going to take, you know, I'm going to start a blog. Um, I'm, I'm mildly dyslexic, so I can teach myself to write effectively. Um, and I just started writing about whatever felt natural and authentic to me. So at the time I was burned out. So I started writing about burnout. Then I started talking about high functioning anxiety. Then I started talking about strategy. And I started, I started talking about all these different things. Now this eventually led me, I was following my curiosity and this eventually led me to what I'm doing now because this is how I discovered multi potentiality. I went, oh, this is who I am. And then of course I focused on that. And then I, uh, I took that, went onto TikTok, built a uh, hundred and thirty thousand plus audience pretty quickly um and that all came into that so basically it was very much following my, my curiosity because previous to that i was doing the very sort of neurotypical social conditioning it's like have a plan have a five-year mm -hmm. plan i was kicking down doors i was I, even though i worked in an unconventional industry of the music industry i had very much con you know a conventional uh, success system right and that led me to a lot of burnout uh, chronic stress insomnia anxiety etc cetera, etc cetera, right Whereas what I do now, it's very much following my curiosity. So I don't have any real plans. It's very much like Taoism or something like that, right? Or Taoism. And uh, I, I just, whatever I feel curious about, I do that because I can only feel curious at one thing at a time. And of course, I feel very motivated when I feel curious because it's very authentic. You can't fake curiosity. So I follow my curiosity and that's what's led me to here. Do you think that we all need this time for exploration like you were just you know throwing stuff out of yourself basically in order to to, to put them out on a table and then wow the, the revelation sort of came or, or are there some mental models and frameworks that are allowed that could allow us to speed up the process basically a hack a trick to just oh, realize this much faster yeah absolutely you have to create content uh the creating content is the fastest way to discover your purpose or you know your unconventional path whatever you want to call it right and this has been proven time and time again if you listen to steve jobs he talks about following your curiosity richard feynman uh the multi-potentialite Nobel prize winner his whole method is uh, of teaching and rapid learning is to find something you feel passionate about and then create your own content about it right so if you look at, if you listen to um, uh, Einstein, uh, uh, Albert Einstein was always going on about following your curiosity. Um, uh, uh, Marie Curie, everyone talks about following your curiosity. Because we have so many different options available to us, we can only be curious at one thing at a time, as I mm -hmm. mentioned earlier. So therefore, if we keep following those curiosities, it'll eventually take us to where we are. But there's a whole bunch of different um, frameworks and mental models that go along the, in conjunction with that. But ultimately, that's what it is. It makes me think, how do you feel about your niche right now? So I understand that you found something that you feel very connected to and you're helping people that you see a younger version of yourself. So that is definitely fulfilling, right? But at the same time, you are a little bit close, let's say, in the box of now being the guy that helps multi-passionalites. And maybe you have other interests somewhere, you know, something pops up here and there and you want to explore it, but your business is now based here. So you need to focus. You need to be on my podcast. You need to talk about the same things you've been talking about for for, for the last, you know, couple of years. Isn't it tiring uh, for a multi-passionalite like yourself? No, because 
<laughs> we've got so many different problems, right? So creativity, mm -hmm. overcoming perfectionism, procrastination, uh, fulfilling your potential, right? Finding purpose, creating purpose, uh, being more philosophical, being more productive. There's so many different areas within it. I, I find I go off when I follow my cute. So my current thing is, my current obsession is uh, uh, deconstructing the neurotypical social conditioning. And that's basically all the, the rules and con conventional norms and societal expectations that have been thrust upon us. Mm -hmm. I, you've got a, you got a niche diet and you've, you can only pick one thing, spend 10,000 hours, be a specialist. It's the only way to be a good capitalist. So I find that I'm, uh, this, is, this is my current uh, obsession. And I will, I will create lots of content around about that. And then I will follow my curiosity within multipotentiality into something else. Maybe it's productivity. Maybe it's about, uh, I don't know, living a good life. Who knows what it will be? But the point is, is that the, the multipotentiality, it's about our lives, right? It's mm -hmm. about our creativity. It's about who we are. It's about our identity. It's about who we want to be. It's about our philosophy. It's about all these different things. And within the, the, the box, and it is a box, but there's so much room within that that I never get bored. How much do you follow your curiosity and how much do you follow the curiosity or questions and problems of your audience? It's all my curiosity, but by solving my problem. So if I, let, let's say if you see, if you read an article about mine, about from me, about perfectionism, mm -hmm. it's because I've been feeling perfectionistic when I wrote that. If you watch a video about uh, of mine about productivity, it's because I'm feeling unproductive at the time. So what I'm doing is I'm processing my emotion because uh, most potentialites have deep emotional worlds, right? And if we don't deal with our with our uh, emotions, we sweep them under the carpet and they overspill. We get burnt out. Maybe we lose our temper. Maybe we get pissed off. Maybe we get depressed. Whatever. The point is we're, we're highly emotional people. So I use my content to process my emotions. So as I say, if I feel uh, procrastination, I will write an article about procrastination, which stops me procrastinating. Now, by solving my problem, I know that I'm also solving my audience's problem because they have the same problems as me because they are literally the younger version of me. So instead of this neurotypical kind of thing, hey, create your marketing avatars, let's make up these fictitious people, which is very inauthentic, what I do is I don't have to know what my audience, well, what do my audience want to read or watch today? I know what I need to write or create today. And by solving my problem, I'm also solving their, their problems too in a really authentic way. Yeah, I, I saw you mention somewhere, I think, that uh, you have around more than 70 videos at a time uh, that are ready, edited, ready to be posted. <laughs> but, but, yeah. but because you didn't feel like this emotion when you created it, you didn't actually post it, right? Correct. So, so let me explain about that. For me, it's all about authenticity, right? So uh, I, uh, one of the neurotypical social conditioning things is to say, hey, listen, it's, it's, you should batch record content. And it's, I totally get that, right? It's also the same with you should have a content calendar, right? I, have, I, I don't have a content calendar. I, I don't know what I'm, what I'm going to create tomorrow. I just create in the moment, right? However, batch and recording makes complete sense, right? So I uh, basically on TikTok, I said, right, okay, I'll go and record five videos. So I recorded five videos. I posted one of them. Uh, and I put the other four in my drafts and I would do that mm -hmm. in the following days. But of course, when I come to do that, I'm in a different emotional space than I was when I first created that video. And therefore, it no longer feels authentic. And I never post them. So yeah, I've got 67, I believe, fully recorded, edited um, videos in my TikTok draft folder. And that's a very common, most potentialite thing. I mean, it's, it's like you're, you're, you're laughing away there. So I'm assuming that you have similar stories, right? Yeah, well, of course. I mean, I I, <laughs> I have tried time blocking and batching and a lot of different tactics yeah. and hacks. And they lasted. I, I managed for a day or two, maybe three. Yeah. And that was sort of it. <laughs> it just it just runs in my brain, runs away in a different direction. And it's just uh, difficult to come back to that specific thing. And honestly, when I watched your TikTok videos and I was scrolling through your content, I was like, oh, damn. So you see right through me, basically. Well, it's only, um, so that, that, I can only see myself, you yeah. see. I had no idea. When I started, nobody was uh -huh. talking about multipotentiality on TikTok. There was a couple of French videos that had maybe a couple hundred views, but that was it. So um, I had no idea. I just started talking about it because it was a way for me to process, you know, my emotions and talk about my curiosity. And it just so happened by me talking about my problems and everybody else did the same. All right, then let's, let's, let's talk TikTok. Um, you grew quite fast. So I guess that's because you found actually a, a, a sort of a lacking space then someone needed to, to to speak out for thousands of people who feel exactly like that uh, and you think that that's what what grew you yeah absolutely i mean uh, as i said and uh, when i when i researched it the first thing you should do 
when you're researching a niche is you, you should see how much demand there already is for it, right? Mm-hmm. So in TikTok, there was zero, okay? And I just thought, okay, so I started for originally my first videos at the very beginning were talking about introvert careers because I'm also introvert and a career, obviously. So I was talking about introvert careers and um, uh, stuff like that. Then uh, I did a video with David Boy, who's a multi-potentialite, and how he stacked up his interest to create Ziggy Stardust, which, uh, which of course, launched him from well, being a one-hit wonder uh, into international global uh, startup, right? And, of course, that, that went viral. So, yeah, I got lucky. Um, but it's not something that uh, I did. I, I, I started that TikTok account to, to, as a way to just process all the information and curiosity. I went into it thinking no one's ever going to get and, as, uh, and bizarrely, uh, uh, even because I didn't have so much pressure on myself, oh, I've got to create this big audience, I inadvertently created a big audience. What was your goal when you started? It was purely, I just was fascinated with multipotentiality. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, my goal, so, so, so there was that, but my main goal was to overcome the fear of being seen, you know, the fear of putting myself out there. I never started uh, my career journey uh, until I was 49. Um, and of course, because I'd spent 28 years uh, helping other creators yeah. be creative, right? I was I was a shadow artist. Uh, for anyone that's read uh, Julia Cameron's The Art's Way, I was I was an, a shadows artist. So in other words, I hid my creativity behind my artists, and I pushed them, and that gave me enough connection to creativity. So I, I was it was a bit of voyeurism, I suppose, right? Mm-hmm. Um, at the age of 49, I left the music industry, and I said, look, I need to do something. I need to overcome this fear. So first of all, I started writing the blog. And of course, that's a lot easier because you're not putting your face out there or whatever. And then when it came to uh, uh, TikTok, I took it as a challenge. And I said, okay, I'm going to put a post 30 videos in 30 days, not to build an audience, but just so that I could expose myself to uh, my perfectionism to overcome it, which worked, by the way. Um, but I, well, the other benefit was that I was talking about my passion, my curiosity. And it just so happened that, you know, Millions of other, tens and tens of millions of other people also have the same problem that uh, I do. Did the viral Bowie video happen already in the first 30 days or that or that was later? No, that was day 31. So if I'd stopped at day 30, <laughs> we wouldn't be having this conversation. And if, uh, by the way, nobody believes me. Go out, you can go back to the beginning and count it. Okay, I will. I will count it. <laughs> you don't have to, but, but, but for, for people that don't believe me. If you're lying, I'm going to put a little warning on the screen. Absolutely, okay? <laughs> absolutely. It's not a lie. Everyone, you know, I tell this to clients. And then I see them the following week or two weeks later, whatever, yeah. right? And they'll go, it's true. It was the 31st video. I say, I know. So, yeah. So, basically, I, 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 I said, I'll do 30 videos for 30 days. And if I, the way I look at things, uh, to overcome perfectionism, I don't, I, 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 I treat everything as tiny, messy experiments. Mm-hmm. So, my, my uh, uh, newsletter, it's now it's got just under 10,000 subscribers. And it's three, it's, well, next week it's three years old, right? But I started as a, a, a tiny, messy experiment. I said, I'll do four articles in four weeks. And if I still enjoy doing it after that period of time, I'll continue. And here we are. The uh, TikTok, I said, okay, I'll do 30 videos in 30 days. And if I still enjoy it, I'll keep going. And then on the 31st day, I had my first viral video. Then I had another one, then another one, and so on. And the reason I, the reason I do that is it, it removes my identity from the fear of failure. Because it's just an experiment. Some experiments work and some experiments don't. So everything for me is an experiment. It's a very healthy approach. I love it. Yeah. Um, and right now, your TikTok grew to over 100,000 people. Um, but I, when I talk with creators, especially those that are huge on TikTok and not many place else, is that there isn't much business coming from TikTok. How, do, how is it for you? Yeah, I disagree. Uh, uh, I mean, I've got a six-figure business, and mm-hmm. that's all come from TikTok. I mean, but what happens is that TikTok's just your discovery channel, right? Exactly. So you need to have a discovery, and uh, the term is a nurturing channel. But I hate it because it sounds very manipulative. But it's a relationship building channel, right? So my discovery channel is TikTok. People come, they see me, find me on TikTok, and then I've got a lead magnet which takes them into the newsletter. And then over the course of the newsletter, whenever they're ready to buy, bear in mind most most people don't, then they approach me, and yeah, we do one to ones, start a community uh, next week. Uh, I've got online courses, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, it's been fantastic. Do all of your sales come from uh, your email list? Yes. Uh, my, I've got a website, uh, which mm-hmm. my friend designed, and it's very beautiful. But only 1% of my sales come from my, web, from my wow. website, and 99% come from TikTok to newsletter to sale. Do you know, if you track it even, 
how long it takes for people from the moment they sign up on average to make a first purchase. Yeah, but 10% of people book me directly just from TikTok. They go, mm-hmm. oh my God, this guy gets me, right? <laughs> I've, I've, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I've got to contact this guy, right? So uh, but 10% of people do that. But most people, um, and it, if, I don't track it per se, but some of them could be a couple of weeks and some of them are like two years. Oh, um, okay. That's, what, that's what's interesting. I, you know, I've got clients way before I was talking about multiple potentiality. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that, that's, that's something else that's interesting for uh, your customers is that when you're really authentic and you create authentic content, you will, you will just naturally attract your audience. So I was attracting multi-potentialites, neurodivergent people before I even, I'd even heard of the term neuros, neurodivergent, or even talked about it. Um, so people that were following me back in the, in the time where I was talking about, well, going through 10 different niches, right? Um, it turns out that they were multi-potentialites and yeah, some of them have become long-term clients for many, many months. Your videos seem like, I like this term, cookie cutter system. Uh, you seem yeah. to sit down from the camera, one, two, three, ten videos <laughs> done. You're not in too much in, in, you're not bothered too much about the quality or the editing or the fancy subtitles or anything like it. Um, have you ever tried it or you considered it or you thought, no, I, I, I would be too distracted too quickly to, 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 follow, to follow and it's better to do anything be uh, focus on the content rather than the on the quality Absolutely. of the video itself. For for me, it's all about simplicity, right? Everything is about simplicity, right? Because if if I say, okay, I want to make the best TikTok videos ever, right? I'm going to buy that course. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Before you know, I've got it. I've, it's so, built up so much in my head. I've become over perfectionistic. I have unrealistic expectations, and the videos will never go out. So for me, TikTok is all about being raw. I just pick up the phone and I just record it, and when as long as I get the message out there. And I've had multiple viral videos, some, you know, m- with millions. Uh, and it's not about the quality of the editing or the camera or any of that stuff. Uh, that's just all bullshit, right? That's all the kind of stuff that gets us stuck and stops us actually starting creating. It's about the content. Oh, but you started having some um, visualizations, uh, cartoonish uh, images. How are you producing those? Because they were pretty cool. Uh, oh, do you mean like the stick figures? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the stick figures are just Canva. Uh, yeah, so basically Canva Pro's got basically stick figures and uh, there's a, a very famous uh, blog, Wait by Why, which was mm-hmm. very big around the Facebook time. Many people know it. And of course, he, he always used um, stick figures. He always drew them in. I thought that's a really cool way of being able to uh, use something very simple, because I'm all about simplicity, uh, to describe complex uh, situations. Yeah. So I just went to Canva and said, oh, stick figure. And they had all these, you know, there's this artist. Um and he's clearly a multi-potentialite because there's lots of content about him looking confused or which way do I go or which way, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and coming back to the viral video, I saw you reposting the video in a similar way multiple yeah. times. Have you have you seen it performing equally good multiple times over and over? No, I, I, th- I think you definitely do. Um, it definitely works, but it, it's it's the, the laws of diminishing returns. So uh-huh. you get, you, for me, it's gone less and less and less, right? Um, but it's it's definitely it's definitely worthwhile to uh, repost content. Uh, the uh, some of it's gone the other way as well, where it, where a video has been relatively successful, maybe ten twenty thousand views, and I put it out again, and it's got hundred two hundred thousand views. Do you have some system for reposting the same stuff? No, I I don't plan anything. If I plan anything, I get I, I become a perfectionist. And if I become a perfectionist, I just don't get shit done. So so basically, I just go okay. What will I do today? Um, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm literally, I've got an article, com- I put out two newsletters, uh, once mm-hmm. on a Wednesday, once on a Saturday, and I have never have anything planned. It's like, okay, well, how am I feeling today? And that scares a lot of people, and it used to yeah. scare me, but I know that I'll always come up with something, because the, you know, the, the kind of things that motivate me is a challenge, novelty, deadline, um, passion, or curiosity, and purpose. And I know that because w- when deadlines come around, right, that helps focus uh, our, our creativity and we always get stuff done. So in other words, to answer your question, um, some days I just go, I don't feel like doing a video today. I'll just repurpose one of my other ones. Which one shall I go? I'll go, oh, I'll, feel, I'll just do that one. So there's no system to it. I'm struck by how different this advice is to what I usually hear and how much more I resonate with it, you know? <laughs> well, the problem is that we, ha- we have all these rules and red, you know, and... Uh, living up to them means getting stuck in perfectionism. And the problem with getting stuck in perfectionism is that we don't publish content. Yeah. And it's more important to publish content than to create perfect content that nobody ever sees. Um, I had one more question regarding your, um, your, your videos and your creativity on TikTok. Uh, repurposing is the 
buzzword of, of of the year. And I wonder why you're not on short or reels. It would be so easy for you to just post it somewhere else. Yeah, it's because I have a limited uh, bandwidth. Uh, because basically, yeah, if, if for me to repurpose and all all these different sites means I need to upload, I need to maintain it. And basically, I get uh, uh, overwhelmed and stressed. Uh, you know, so I keep I, it simple. I, I keep it simple, basically. <laughs> I mean, my whole thing's keeping it simple. Um, so, I am. Uh, I, I do do a bit on LinkedIn. I'm going to start doing some more LinkedIn stuff. I'm going to take the content uh, that I'm creating, the frameworks and many models that I'm creating um, uh, for the community, and I'm going to repurpose that to an extent, um, keeping most of the mm-hmm, exclusive mm-hmm. content for the community. But basically, yeah, I, I, everything's about simplicity for me. Now, again, this will go against pretty much every, every, uh, every most guests you've had on here. But I don't have any. Fantastic. I don't have. I don't. I don't have any um, uh, email sequences. I've got no funnels. I've got nothing at all. It, my business is super simple. I have a website, and honestly, it only produces one percent of my business. So honestly, I, I could do without a website altogether. And it's just basically creating content, um, vulnerable content that connects deeply with an audience. Okay. So I'm not manipulating them. I'm, uh, I'm resonating with them. Uh, and that the only funnel is basically from TikTok into the newsletter and people buy when they're ready. That's it. Boom. And we have our snippet. We have our show. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> All right, you're also part of um, creator community, maybe more than once. We are share we share one community that we're we in do. together. Um, and I wonder how, what is the investment that you're making there, and what is the return that you're getting from people? Is it just lead generation uh, platform for you, or is it actually helping you become a better creator? And in what way? Well, I think that's I think that's the question. Is that you? We invest money, okay, mm-hmm. and at the end of the day. I, I basically I, I invest money for in communities for one year. Okay, I mm-hmm. say I commit to one year. At the end, I mean the, the career uh, lab, as you know, is a is an annual thing anyway, right? So it, uh, so I pay two thousand dollars for that. So at the end of the year, I have to say, okay, have I created two thousand dollars worth of opportunities? Is it lead generated? Okay, have I learned something? One idea that's created me at least two thousand dollars, and th- at the end of the year, I do an audit. If if it has then I'll say, okay, great, I will do it again. And if it hasn't, I go on off to another community. I'm also another community for, for newsletters, um, and that's $19 a month, right? So I dip in, I dip out, I say, okay, is there any ideas here for me? And that's how I view it, and that's how I sell my community to, to my audience as well. I say, look, if you have one idea, right, uh, uh, then the, you know, the fee pays for itself, right? Can you share the fee? Well, my fee is only $15 a month. Wow, that that's barely any investment exactly it's, it's 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 a newsletter it's a newsletter community basically um and that's what it is and it's all about uh mental models and frameworks to be more creative to overcome our fears but mostly it's about deconstructing because this is my current obsession deconstructing the social conditioning that keeps us trapped right um can you tell me a, a bit about your products and the um, pricing range uh and i presume that there is some little funnel right that uh, people probably start with the uh, maybe paid community for 15 bucks per month, but they go up to coaching. Uh, can you tell us how it looks like? Yeah, so my, my, my coaching, I do one-to-one coaching, it's $200. And I don't do any um, discovery calls or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I don't have any uh, long-term, I don't have, oh, this is my six, uh, this is my six-week program or my 12-week program. I don't have any of that at all. I basically meet clients um, and I solve problems. Now, that can sometimes that can be one session. Sometimes it's three sessions or four sessions or five sessions. So I don't have any uh, uh, programs because in the music industry, I never had any program to help an artist have a number one record. You're very much having to work in a very bespoke and authentic way with uh, each individual client. So my, my coaching is very much the same. So yeah, so it's $200 a session and that could be, if it's five sessions, it's a thousand or whatever, right? And then I've also got a, uh, an online digital course which is uh, only 68 minutes long because it's uh, I kept it deliberately that, that length. Uh, and it's got a completion rate of about 56%, which as you know, and the industry average is about 14% if we're lucky, right? And the reason for that is I've kept it really, really short. I've not got really insecure that, hey, I feel really insecure about creating this content. I'm going to put in three hours of fluff to try and justify the uh, fee. And uh, anyway, I charge $125 for that. Is your six-figure business based mostly on your time spent with the clients, or it, yeah, yeah, 
yeah, I mean, I, I would I would say I'd say coaching is about sixty percent of that, and then obviously uh, the online online course. Um, and then, of course, the community is a new thing that starts next week. So, but yeah, I mean, but most most of the time is one to one. Yeah. Would you like to switch the the the, the proportions the other way around? Uh, I'm going to do a wee bit less uh, one to ones, mm -hmm. but I love doing one to ones. All my content ideas come from one to ones. I could be having a conversation with a client. They say oh, I've got this problem. I say okay, cool, and that then becomes the content. But however, I'm, 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 I'm changing that a wee bit. So in the community, it's going to be like a sort of a, a, an advice column or something like that. Uh, community members are going to be able to post problems and I'm going to create, try, try and create, you know, authentic solutions and mm -hmm. frameworks and mental mo models to overcome their problems. Okay. But uh, the reason I want to do the community is that it gives me accountability because uh, I want to write a book. As I want to write a book about all this. So I said, okay, I'm going to create a community. And that way I can do a bunch of real-time experiments because I've got a whole bunch of different frameworks and strategies uh, with the community members and see which ones get the best results. And that's the ones that'll get into the book. That's, um, that's amazing having sort of an, uh, an audience who pays you uh, to, 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 so you can test, make, make tests on them and, and create even better products and better offers. <laughs> Fantastic. Then uh, we can wrap it up with my favorite section, which is uh, always reveals some interesting uh, answers, a quick fire round. Okay, I will ask you quick questions and give me short answers as short as possible. Well, Please. I will try and give you short answers, but I do have, yeah. Well, you, you can have a thing. You can have a longer thing. We can cut okay. out the silences, but please try, try to give me short answers. And if not, okay. I'm going to just cut you out completely. <laughs> Fair enough. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Are you a team player or lone wolf? Uh, I'm a lone wolf that uh, creates for the team. Take risks or carefully calculate? Take risks. Mobile or desktop? Uh, desktop. Who inspires you most? Uh, divergent thinkers, uh, every multi-potential light that's ever existed. What profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? Okay, I, I'd be a full-time author. Good one. What is an underappreciated business tool that you couldn't live without? Uh, authenticity. Uh, what's your productivity life hack? Time blocking. Uh, it, it's, really, it's really tough in the beginning and uh, everyone thinks it doesn't work, but if you stick with it, it will work. And what does success mean to you? Be able to help the younger version of myself uh, avoid uh, or overcome the same issues that I have uh, <laughs> or I've, I've experienced uh, and yeah, live an unconventional business of life. Awesome. Okay, now uh, for a bit uh, private talk, I need to know how did you make time blocking work? Because... I, I loved it, but I couldn't stick with it because always something pops up. It, you know, ruins the, the calendar box that I was I had blocked for something yeah. and then it all falls apart. Okay, so yeah, I, I, so my problem was, uh, so I'll tell you how it didn't work for me, mm -hmm. right? I used to go between 8 and 12, it's just creativity. And I would go, okay, so I would turn, I turn up this desk here at 8 o'clock. I'll go, okay, uh, do I do writing first or do I do the video first? And I'll go, oh, I don't write it first. Before I do it, 45 minutes is gone. Then I'm pissed off with myself because I wasted 45 minutes. So then, you know, and if I'm pissed off, my creativity is down. Blah, 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 blah. So it's going to be very, 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 very specific, right? I switch off my phone, okay? So in the mornings, it's all creativity. So from 8 till 10, for, ex for example, right? It's writing. So mm -hmm. I switch off my phone and from 8 to 10, I force myself to write, okay? From 10 to 12, let's say I'm doing a, a, an online course, right? So it's, it's building out an online course, right? And then 12 to 12.30, uh, I go for a walk and that gives me a chance to process uh, all my creativity, my ideas, because often writing is like, uh, you know, jigsaw. It's like, okay, this bit, this bit, where's the thing, right? So I do that and then I have my lunch and then I have one-to-ones um, and I do three one-to-ones a day. So um, basically it's been very hyper-specific, but mm -hmm. sticking with it because basically I failed at it so many times, but uh, but yeah, it's, stick it's sticking with it and doing things that uh, energize you uh, and don't drain you. So, for example, maybe maybe this podcasting, you may maybe doing being a podcast host actually energizes you because you get to speak to other creators and stuff like that, right? So basically, I did a, what I call an energy audit, and I went through all the things I went through the day. I said, you know, does this give me energy? Does it drain me energy? Mm -hmm. Is it neutral? And I removed as much as I could, because you can't remove everything, the things that drain me and focused on the things uh, that energize me. So my, my business is really, really simple. It's writing, creating, and doing one-to-ones. That's it. One last uh, question. Are you the person that starts off the day with the thing that energizes you or the most dreaded task? 
Uh, I start off the day by getting good dopamine. So I go down, I exercise. And each morning when I'm walking downstairs, I'm going, I don't want to exercise. My brain's coming up with excuses why you don't have to exercise. You've been doing so much exercise and take the day off. Blah, 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 blah. I force myself to do my exercise. And then I'm, I've created a positive dopamine, a productive dopamine. And then I get my cup of coffee and I'm straight up here and that's me writing. All right. Then I know what I will try starting tomorrow morning. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jake, for for. For joining and what happened why weren't you swearing you wanted to swear on this podcast and you well, I, don't like, think it... well I, I think i just swear a couple of times but it's just something that happens naturally to me so but yeah but other I'm than that I absolutely i absolutely <laughs> loved it thank you so much and um yeah your community sounds uh, very interesting to me personally to be honest good well i look forward to seeing you there then absolutely thanks jake thank you very much thank you thank you bye-bye well thanks everyone i felt like Jake has seen right through me and I bet I'm not the only one. And uh, thank you to Jake and thank you for listening to Careers to Play I'll see you around.